And our fathers fought the Second World War, spent their weekends on the Jersey Shore. And our mothers in the USO asked them to dance, dance with them slow. And oh, oh God, are we on the air? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, just singing some Billy Joel there about the Jersey Shore, and that's rather fitting for tonight's uh, Fangs and Folklore episode. So, uh, welcome to Fangs and Folklore. As you most probably know, I am your host, Matthew Miller, expert in all things monster and paranormal. I'm a horror writer from the swamps of haunted Louisiana, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to my horrifying world. Please check out my books on Amazon, beginning with Blood Feud, a punk rock vampire story. Uh, it's a, a part one of the series of The Gravediggers. The Gravediggers are a punk rock band, failing punk rock band, who run into all sorts of monsters. It's horror, it's comedy, it's super entertaining, so I hope you will check it out. Um, I also quickly announced my new editing company, PolishedNovels.com. Don't think of sending your book out into the world without a professional editor looking at it first. Okay, so, early America, and by America I mean the USA, was full of legends and lore and things in the night. Settlers from crowded Europe suddenly found themselves in this vast wilderness, in open prairies and deserts and endless thick forests, and they struggled against nature and learned as they went. It's no surprise then that they found monsters everywhere. The wilderness was full of dark and menacing creatures, just waiting for someone to leave the safety and light of the campfire, the farmhouse, so to speak, to pounce upon them and drag them away. Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but as you may know, I've been adding wine uh, reviews to Fangs and Folklore. If you don't like wine, you can skip this part. It's no problem. I do like wine. I'm a big fan of red wine, and tonight I've chosen a selection. Uh, it's called Element Luna. Laudan, and it's a uh, Côte du Rhône village. Uh, I believe the year here is a 2018, okay, which is a decent year for Côte du Rhône village. And uh, this little number should cost you less than $10 if you pick it up at Costco. And it's a, a pretty good wine. It's French, obviously. And the grapes are, uh, I, I believe, so it's, if it's a Côte du Rhône village, it has to have uh, Grenache. Yes, so we have Syrah, Grenache, and Morvedre, okay, the three classic grapes of um, of Côte du Rhône village. And I have a bit poured here in my cup uh, goblet, skull goblet that I found up in the uh, hidden room up here. We're here here in the in the uh, studios of Fangs and Folklore, the abandoned castle in the forest. So what we're going to do, give it a sniff. So I detect that typical Syrah smoothness and mellow uh, nature, that, that, that luscious sort of smell and mouthfeel. Feel, excuse me, I detect some, uh, for sure, some, um, detect for sure some dark fruit. It's not uh, very heavy on the nose. It's very light, actually. So let's give it a taste here. It's really good. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's definitely, there's definitely a little acidity there, first of all. Tannins are light to medium, more on the light side. Definitely some dark fruit, some blackberry, um, uh, black currant. Those are pretty common. Um, but also a light floral element, which is common in the Côte du Rhône region. Uh, definitely some floral elements there. And a tiny bit of mineral or something. Uh, not a lot of oak. I'm going to give it, be honest, I'm not tasting a lot of oak. And there, there we go. The tannins are hitting now. See, light to medium. Okay, light to medium tannins. Yeah, really, really good. And it's a great bargain. It's a great value. So if you like Côte du Rhône, uh, French red wine, I highly suggest it. Again, it is called Element Luna uh, Laudan Côte du Rhône Village 2018. Highly recommended. Very, very good. I got it for like $8. Can't beat that. Okay. Now, you're not here for a wine review only. <laughs> Maybe you're here a little bit for a wine review. But... Um, you know, we're talking about cryptids in this, this uh, series, or this season of Fangs and Folklore. And surely one of the most interesting and wildly horrifying cryptids out there is the Jersey Devil. That's right. We th what do you think about when you think of New Jersey? Get past the Guidos and their fake Italian culture that's nothing like real Italians. Get past the Joysy accent. Get past the gritty uh, uh, cities and so forth. And you actually will find a beautiful state full of wilderness. When I first drove from Louisiana to New York, I lived in New York City for years, and I drove up there to move. And I remember the most beautiful state I passed was West Virginia. Second most beautiful easily was New Jersey. Just gorgeous, man, just gorgeous. 
They call it the Garden State for a reason, you know. Um, it's a legend, the Jersey Devil, found in New Jersey and parts of Pennsylvania. So the legend says that there is a monster out in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens, that's a name for an enormous pine forest, that you might imagine, with sandy soil. It stretches across much of New Jersey. And it would be very easy to get lost in the pines, you know. Uh, and equally easy for a creature to hide out there. There's a kind of an old country song about in the pines, in the pines, you know, where the, I don't know, the sun doesn't shine or something like this. He lost his lover, his lady got lost in the pines or something. So, yeah, the pines, the pine barrens. As for the Jersey Devil itself, I'm going to say that it walks a very fine line between cryptid and monster. A cryptid, if you remember, is a possibly real natural animal that just has not yet been discovered by science and classified. Uh, uh, the coelacanth fish was one uh, example in our lifetimes. A monster, however, is decidedly supernatural and paranormal. It's in the same category as vampires, for example. And uh, I would consider the New Jersey Devil, the Jersey Devil, uh, a cryptid, except that its origin story seems pretty unnatural to me. Uh, what does it look like? Supposedly looks like a horse or a goat, but with two legs, with hooved feet, either no arms or short arms like those of a kangaroo or T-Rex. <laughs> it has the head of a goat or a horse, leathery wings that, that it can use to fly, and a tail that is forked at the end. I'm going to show you a drawing of what it's supposed to look like here. If you're listening, it's just exactly as I described. A flying goat, kind of. Um, now the backstory is equally as unique and interesting as the devil's appearance. It begins back in colonial America in the 1700s. So the Jersey Devil was originally called the Leeds Devil, L-E-E-D-S. It's believed that this refers to the legend of the Leeds family, and the folklore says that uh, a Pine Barrens family named the Leeds, and Pine Barrens, people who live out in the Pine Barrens have always been considered very rural, rural, very rustic, very uh, traditional, and kind of, you know, they were looked down upon a lot at first, but now they're kind of proud of their heritage, uh, as they should be. And so, um, the legend states that Mother Leed had 12 children, that's a lot of children, and was they were poor, so that's way too many, first of all. Found out she was pregnant again for the 13th time, and she cursed the child, saying, This child is going to be the devil. Well, in 1735, she, uh, she gave birth, and it was a dark and stormy night. It actually was supposed to be. Uh, the child was born, but immediately transformed into this creature with hooves, uh, into the Jersey Devil, basically. And it, it flew up the chimney and out into the pines, in some versions of the tale, Mother Leeds was a witch who made a deal with the devil, and the devil was actually the, the Jersey Devil's father, like Satan was his father. And then uh, other versions say that preachers and priests came out to try to exorcise the devil from the Pine Barrens without success. Of course, there was a real Leeds family, yes. Who were they? Some people believe Mother Leeds was a certain Deborah Leeds, and her husband uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, claimed that they had 12 children in his will. And um, they lived, lived in uh, the Pines, in the Pine Barrens, in the area where the Jersey Devil is supposed to uh, be. Now, um, some scholars believe that it's a folk legend, and it's actually just gossip and folklore that has to do with colonial-era politics, you see. Um, back in that era, you know, some people were loyalists to the English throne, some were revolutionaries. And I'm sure you've heard of a Mr. Benjamin Franklin. He was, among other things, a printer, right? He had a publishing house, a, pr a printing house. And um, he, uh, he was, his competitor was Daniel Leeds, one of the Leeds family. And uh, he didn't like him very much. He often, you know, Franklin had a sharp tongue and a funny wit, and uh, he, he didn't hold back. So he actually described Leeds as a devil, uh, Leeds the devil, right? And some people think, okay, that created the Leeds devil idea. And uh, much like Mother Leeds, the actual Daniel Leeds' third wife had nine kids. Uh, uh, and he was a, a loyalist to the British uh, crown, which means people liked him even less in that area. And so he, um, he had some land uh, around the area where the Jersey Devil's supposed to be. Now, he was a Quaker. If you're not familiar with the Quakers, it's a religion. Uh, and they basically, it's, it's, they stand around until they get some kind of revelation from God and they shake and quake. That's why they call the Quakers, right? He was a Quaker and he published in his Farmer's Almanac astrological symbols, astrological signs. And they said, uh, that's not Christian. Uh, you are not uh, welcome in our church anymore. And they, uh, they cast him out, basically excommunicated him from the Quaker community. 
So he said, all right, well, screw you. I'm going to make my, my almanac even more occult. And he became um, fascinated with Christian occultism and demonology and angelology, natural magic, and so forth. They became further, further and further away from the Quaker orthodoxy. And so he was out of there, right? Now, um, Leeds was also endorsed by a, a pro-crown uh, governor, Lord Cornbury, and that made him even less beloved among his peers. Now, in 1716, Daniel Leeds' son, Titan, took over his father's business, the almanac printing business, and competed then directly with Ben, ben Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, which I'm, you may have heard of. Um, so Franklin, uh, <laughs> he, he used fake astrology in one, in one of his issues to predict Titan Leeds' death. <laughs> and that, that, you know, as a joke, but Titan Lee didn't like it very much. And he, he got angry, called Ben Franklin a liar and an idiot. And then he, Franklin, wrote back and said how, how outrageous and ridiculous the man has no sense of humor. And um, that he had actually died and his ghost was the one who was angry at Franklin. Franklin made up this story for, as a joke, you know. But he referred to him as a ghost and a devil. And he had a bad reputation. He was considered a cult, blasphemous. So this, some people believe this is the origin of the Jersey Devil, a folklore that arose from a real person who was... Uh, demonized, so to speak, by his peers. Now, also, the Leeds family had a family crest, which was basically a wyvern, which is, you know, wyvern, wyvern, both are correct pronunciations. It's a dragon with, without arms, a dragon with two legs. And so people say that they, uh, he put that family crest on his almanacs, the Leeds family crest, and so maybe that associated them with, uh, you know, it kind of looks like the Jersey Devil is described as looking. Maybe the wyvern, and, and with along with the... Uh, the hatred toward the Leeds family came up with this, you know, people came up with this legend of the, the monster, the myth, the devil, who is the Leeds devil. All right, so with this fascinating backstory, let's look at a few alleged sightings. Uh, 1812 seems to be the first one when none other than Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Joseph, claimed he saw the Jersey devil. And he, he had an estate there, he had some hunting ground, hunting land. And sightings were common around that time, actually. Animal attacks, strange footprints left and uh, eyewitness reports. And so Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother, said, yes, I very clearly saw the Jersey Devil. Wow. In 1909, there were a thousand plus reports of sightings of the Jersey Devil. And a, uh, a naval commander, Stephen Decatur, was testing cannons at, uh, at a, a factory, I guess cannonball factory. And he saw the creature and he shot at it with a cannon and hit it, but the creature just flew off as if nothing was wrong. They found tracks in the fields, strange footprints, but the, the bloodhounds wouldn't follow them. They were scared. Huh. Uh, we see next in 1927, a taxi driver in Salem City uh, was changing his tire, and he said that a winged creature landed on the top of his taxi and was hitting it, right? Um, in 1960, May, uh, May's Landing, which is a little community in the Pine Barrens, they heard screams in the night. Now, the, the Jersey Devil is supposed to have these inhuman shrieking screams that are terrifying. And people began to panic, right? And so apparently police went around hanging flyers saying it's just a myth, it's not real. But a, uh, a circus owner uh, created a $100,000 reward for the capture of the creature, the Jersey Devil. And in 1960, that's a lot of money. Still a lot of money. I would love to have that, but 1960, even more. Another lady, Mary Ritzer Christensen, um, said that in 1972, she saw the Jersey Devil on Green Tree Road. And uh, it was very tall, uh, taller than a human with thick uh, legs, like a horse kind of. You know how a horse's legs, they kind of go backwards, they have these thick uh, thighs. And a head like a, a goat, and um, it, was, it was very furry, she said woolly, the head. Now, um, Forest Ranger, 1980. Alan McFarlane, a forest ranger of all people, they tend to be pretty serious, uh, observant people, these forest rangers. They're not the kind to make up stories as a joke. They take their job very seriously. And they saw, saw uh, he came upon a pack of a group of pigs that had been just totally slaughtered. He said the backs of their heads were eaten, like eaten away, and their bodies were torn apart, and there was no evidence of any tracks or, or any, anything around them to indicate how they had gotten killed. So perfect for a flying creature, right, to swoop down and kill them and fly off. In 1988, um, a reporter uh, reported a story about a man in Howell Township who said that he uh, encountered the, the Jersey Devil face-to-face -face and even described his teeth as being really large. 
1980s, a group of uh, wild young dirt bikers were <laughs> riding around their dirt bikes, and they said that the bikes all quit out on them at the same time. Uh, and they heard this loud, inhuman shrieking scream from the woods, scared the hell out of them, ran back to the camp, and everyone at the camp said, yeah, we heard that too. They went to a local bar that night, and a bartender told him, yep, you've, saw, you've encountered the Jersey Devil. <laughs> In 1933, another forest ranger saw the Jersey Devil, said it's six feet tall, had horns, had black fur. He said they stared at each other, and then the thing ran away into the forest. This is another forest ranger. Again, they're serious people. They are good at their job, and they don't make up things about the forest. Okay, um, another person, Fran Coppola, who owned a, uh, I guess, a, a bar or some kind of a bar, saw a shadow of the Jersey Devil on the wall in front of her, as if it were behind her. She didn't look, but she said she felt calm and protected by it. Three cars on Route 9 were uh, had to stop because a 10-foot tall Jersey Devil with long head, with short ears, ran across the road, out of the woods and back to the woods on the other side of the road. Um, now, in 2015, we have a recent sighting with a photograph. A certain Mr. David Black, Route 9, he said he saw, he th saw what he thought was a llama walking in and, out, in and out of the trees, a llama, and then it spread its wings and flew away. And he took a picture of it on his cell phone. And I'm going to show you this photo right now. Take a look. And for the listeners, it looks basically like a goat with wings. It doesn't look super large. It looks like a goat with wings, but it's not a lot of uh, context to tell its size. And as with all cryptid photos, of course, it's blurry, right? You can never get a clear picture with all our technology. And I don't know. It looks like it could have been possibly a model hung up from a tree cleverly, but it looks like it could be something real, too. It looks The fur looks pretty real. It looks really furry. That's interesting. Now, after that, and Emily Martin has a video she posted of the Jersey Devil uh, on Old Port Republic Road near Leeds Point. And both of these people swear they didn't doctor them or make them up. Okay. So let me show you the video. Um, take a look here. This, I'm not sure of, for the listeners, looks very much like the thing in the previous photo, a goat with wings. It flies across the screen in a wooded area, and the wings are beating really fast and look pretty small. Again, it could have been a model somehow made to fly across the screen, I don't know. The movement of it looks kind of unnatural, like it wouldn't really fly well according to physics, but then again, if the Jersey Devil is supernatural, that would explain that, right? We know how easy it is these days to fake a photo or a video using computers. So, you know, these are exciting. They're, they're intriguing, but I can't say a hundred percent that they're real or not. Here's another image allegedly from a trail cam with night vision in 2007. It looks like the typical Jersey devil description. And it looks like, uh, for the listeners, like it's, you know, a horned goat, a winged goat. It looks like it's chasing a small animal, maybe a deer and its head and face look terrifying. <laughs> Again, with CGI, you can do anything, but I don't know. It's, it's, if it's a real photo, it's pretty convincing. So that's the backstory, some sightings, and as far as I know, the only two photos and the only one video that exists of the Jersey Devil. So what are some theories about this creature? Let's take a look. First, there's the possibility that it is a real supernatural creature, born of a curse and born of the devil. And that would explain how it's been around for hundreds of years, right? Unless there's a population of them breeding, then, uh, then the, it would have to be about 300 years old and still going strong. And according to its creation myth, it would have to be solitary, right? Only one of them was created, the only one of its kind. And I guess your acceptance of this theory depends on your belief in the supernatural or not. As you probably know, I do leave my mind open to the paranormal and the supernatural, so I can accept at least the possibility that the Jersey Devil is a real supernatural entity born of evil. Um, possible to prove until we capture it. <laughs> and speaking of, it could be a cryptid, meaning a real natural animal that um, has just not yet been discovered and categorized and classified. But if this is the case, then there would have to be a population, I would think, not only because the thing would have to be over 300 years old, but because different sightings have alleged different heights and, and, and uh, sizes of the creature. Um, well, we have a lot of sightings, right? Some eyewitness accounts, supposedly, allegedly. 
And again, the barrens are an enormous wilderness. It'd be easy for a population of those to hide themselves, eat the local animals. Third possibility is what I mentioned before, that the Jersey Devil, previously the Leeds Devil, was a personification of Daniel or Titan Leeds, promoted by the Quakers and by Ben Franklin. This seems like a possible, reasonable theory to me. Also follows the tra trajectory of many uh, folk tales and, and uh, monster myths, but it wouldn't explain the sightings of an actual creature. Finally, there's a possibility that the Jersey Devil is a creation by the early European pioneers, the settlers in the so-called New World, although I'll mention that humans were living here just fine for 20,000 years, but I digress. Facing harsh environments, harsh conditions, you know, the wilderness outside the campfire must have seemed just full of darkness, full of the unknown. Nothing to them, for Europeans, feels familiar or safe. And they're struggling against nature. It's hard. It's a hard life. And in those conditions, it's easy to create monsters whose legends, you know, live on through the generations. And we don't, we don't understand, modern people like us, we don't sometimes realize what electricity has done for us. Imagine living in a, you know, a little cabin, and at night, the only uh, light is candlelight, you know? I mean, kind of like this. Uh, uh, you know, it's easy to see monsters out there, right? It's the same reason some people are scared of the dark, even if it's their own bedroom, right? You can't see what's not there. And it may be irrational, but it touches on, I think, a prim primal evolutionary instinct for survival. You can't fight something you can't see. You can't fight something you don't understand. Much safer retreat into the cave at night, bundle up in your bearskin rugs or whatever, and wait till the daylight to go back out again and hunt. I don't know. What do you think, my dear listeners? Is the Jersey Devil real? Supernatural? A cryptid? A myth created by Ben Franklin? A myth created out of the psyche of early settlers? As for me, I think that if it's anything, it's supernatural. It's got to be. It's got to be if it's anything. And if not, then it's likely the product of the mind of these settlers in this new scary world. Whatever it is, it's a scary folktale for sure. I think I mentioned it already, but the Jersey Devil is supposed to make an inhuman uh, shrieking cry that scares the hell out of campers. Now, I'm inside here in, in the, uh, the Fangs and Folklore studio in the abandoned castle in the middle of the forest, and I feel kind of safe here, kind of protected from the outside, even though this rust on the wall is still bothering me. I think I need to scrape off a sample of this and have it sent to a lab or something. I guess it's just probably just rusty water. But anyway, uh, it's supposed to make this shrieking cry, right? The Jersey Devil that scares the hell out of campers. In fact, if I remember cor correctly, that wait, what's that? What the hell? Uh, yeah, I think that's my cue to get out of here very quickly. Uh, thanks for listening, and sleep well if you can. In the pond, in the pond, where the sun don't ever shine, I wish you would, oh, night too.